So I'm going to turn the program over to Adelia. We're very fortunate to have her. She interned in um, uh, Senator Haggerty's office and she also interned with the South Dakota Legislature. So uh, because uh, Adelia uh, is a wonderful young person, she's a writer for the Tennessee Conservative News, um, and we want to engage the youth. So she's going to help us tell us how we can get young conservatives engaged in the political process. So let's have a nice warm welcome for Adelia. She brought her mom along to work the uh, PowerPoint presentation. And thank you for coming. She came all the way from Middle Tennessee to be with us this morning. Adelia, thank you again for being here. Thank you all for having me. It's nice to see such a big group of people show up for something like this because, you see, I'm, I'm quite new to uh, rural living. Uh, my family moved out to Hurricane Mills, Tennessee, which is a little bit past Dixon, uh, last year, beginning of last year. So uh, before that, I always lived in the suburbs, and uh, now we are living where there is, like, nobody. <laughs> There's not even this group of people. <laughs> so it's a little bit of an adjustment, but yeah. All right. So good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I love that. Okay. <laughs> I feel so important. Um, <laughs> my name is Adelia Kirchner. First name is Hebrew. Last name is German. Pretty sure that was an unintentional combination, but the end result is amusing either way. Unless it's not, don't pay too much attention to that. When I was in middle school, I read a fictional book series where the main character got her psychology degree and became a school counselor. And so, being the young, impressionable child that I was, I declared to my homeschooling mother that I was also going to be a school counselor when I grew up. When I was 14, a man in conversation with my father asked what I wanted to go to school for. And when I said sociology and psychology so I could be a school counselor because they always need more of those, he said I should probably pick something that makes more money. <laughs> Fast forward into my adult life and I'm standing here thinking about how that same man's head would probably explode if I said I ended up majoring in English. <laughs> With the focus in creative writing. And that I actually dropped out of school midway through my junior year. In fact, he'd probably have an aneurysm if I told him my dreams have changed and I just want to meet a good guy, get married, have a bunch of kids, and homeschool them in a country where I still have the freedom to do so. Right <laughs> Only downside is I hear the salary for that one isn't very competitive, but I'm sure that that man would tell me if he got the chance. Anyway. Somebody rich enough. <laughs> she said marry somebody rich enough. Anyways, from what I've seen, the beginning of a speech is typically when a person brags about their accomplishments so that the audience can see where they get the authority to speak on whatever it is they're speaking on. Now, I'm far from the most ambitious 20 year old to ever exist, uh, but I will do my best. <laughs> when I graduated high school, I had already completed the first year and a half of my bachelor's degree via dual enrollment courses at two of the local colleges near me. And being an A student with grand expectations of dorm life, um, I secured a pretty close to a full ride scholarship to attend a prestigious and somewhat uppity private university in Wisconsin. One of the many universities that tells their students that they belong there and they're very important to the school and the school cares about diversity and inclusion. <laughs> that same university would eventually tell me to comply with their COVID policies or transfer and no, we will not put that in writing, they said. <laughs> so after a year of waiting for their COVID policies to change, I withdrew, only for them to award me the English department's Hicks Prize in Fiction for the best short story just after I had withdrawn and was no longer a student there. Now, considering I only ever took two college-level political science courses, they were both intro-level, and I've already established the fact that I was an English major, I guess I should give you all a bit of context for how I ended up here at the Conservative Club of Teleco. Now, like Rick said, <laughs> I have done those internships, but I'm going to give you my spin on it, okay? Um, given the turbulence of my educational career, I found other ways to occupy my time off of school. And don't worry, most of those ways were parental approved. 
Even if they weren't, I wouldn't be telling you, not because I don't trust you, okay, but because my mom is in the back of the room. Uh. <laughs> As an unpaid intern for Senator Haggerty's office in Nashville, I had the opportunity to work alongside the studying Rachel Jones, for those of you familiar with Truesdale County's past GOP chairs. I spent most of my time writing program bios and recommendation letters, answering phones, and reading those federal government report packets they put out for all their little initiatives. Okay, I did that whenever I got bored, which was a lot. The only thing I really learned from that experience, to be completely honest, was how to look always busy in an office with glass walls. I also learned about Nashville traffic. Uh, that was exhilarating. 10 out of 10 recommend. But not learning anything government related at that internship didn't stop me from pretending that I did. And somehow I ended up with a paid internship working for the House Appropriations Chair, Chris Carr in South Dakota during last year's legislative session. The budget committee man, again, English major. <laughs> um, some people ask why I didn't just intern at the Tennessee Capitol, so to get that out of the way, um, I didn't even think about it because at the time I wasn't a permanent resident of Tennessee. I did grow up here, but I spent most of my high school in Texas. Um, I also liked what Governor Christy Nolan was saying up there. So I applied to their internship program and that was that. There's a picture of me with her up there. Isn't that crazy? So exciting. Um, <laughs> and beautiful here, South Dakota. Yes, <laughs> very much so. The sunsets in South Dakota are amazing. Um, my mom was probably very jealous of that. I'm a hands-on learner, okay? So, no, I did not study the glossary before showing up to my first day at the Capitol. And when it was time to head to caucus, I followed the crowd and hoped for the best because I had no idea what that meant. Turned out it was just a secret Republican meeting, but you know, whatever. Um, I learned so much during the three months of South Dakota's legislative obsession, and I like to put it this way. Okay, when I first got there, I had to go to the fiscal staff all the financially knowledgeable people, right? And I had to ask them questions that the representatives sent me with. And then I had to come back to the representatives and tell them what the fiscal staff said. And for the first couple weeks, everything they said to me was gibberish, uh, absolute and under complete gibberish. But by the time I left South Dakota, I could listen to what a fiscal staff member said to me and turn around and explain it in my own words to anybody. And that felt good. I had a brand new set of eyes to view politics through. I finally had a hands-on grasp of what the legislative process was like. And towards the end of last year, I decided to start a podcast in order to share my views as a young conservative. And finally, in January of this year, I was able to really blend my love of writing with my interest in government and politics because I began writing quite regularly for the Tennessee Conservative where I've had the pleasure of aligning myself with the likes of Brandon Lewis, who I'm sure you are decently acquainted with at this point. <laughs> now, I was asked to speak today on how to grow and engage young conservatives and what issues are the most important to us. And my first thought when contemplating what I had to say on the subject was something along the lines of, well, it's all kind of subjective, isn't it? <laughs> Um, not only is each young conservative unique with different thought processes and lifestyles and stances on certain issues, but I don't even know what's considered young. I mean, I think young people and I think college and high school students. My mom thinks young people and she probably thinks people under 30. My grandpa thinks young people and he probably thinks people under 50, you know? So I don't know what each of you classifies as young, but from interactions with what I consider to be young conservatives, some of the most often discussed ideas are those, or ideas and issues at least, are those that affect us on a daily basis, okay? The K through 12 education issues, higher education issues, the economic state of our country, the gender identity ideology, okay? The race ideology. We're constantly having certain things shoved down our throats, so that's constantly a topic of discussion. It's constantly an issue we're having to address in our lives. Now, I've met people, young people, who vote Republican who believe abortion should be legal. I've met young people who vote Republican who think that we should ban fracking without any like 
replacement plan. I've met young people who vote Republican who don't see the problems behind made up pronouns. I've also met young people who vote Republican who believe the exact opposite and those who believe somewhere in between. Just because someone is Republican or votes Republican, as I'm sure you all know, it does not mean that they hold conservative values. They may be libertarian or someone who a couple decades ago would have called themselves a liberal, but now the left has gone so far progressive they can't even begin to fathom that. Um, and sometimes it's just somebody who's Republican who's been bought out, right? And just because someone is conservative, it doesn't mean that they vote. But if they do, they would probably vote Republican because, you know, the whole lesser of two evils thing, right? This is where me labeling myself a conservative comes in. I don't walk around calling myself a Republican because the Republican Party, the GOP, usually doesn't line up with my interests unless they pick up conservative values for a hot second, okay? If a Republican candidate runs on a conservative platform, then of course I'm gonna vote for them, but that doesn't make me a Republican. So I think it's important to differentiate between the two, whether or not you think there's a difference, this is how I see it. Uh, Republicans stand behind the GOP and don't necessarily hold on to conservative values, and conservatives stand behind conservative values and in politics that often translates into voting for GOP members and supporting some GOP policy. Now, if you don't get what I'm <laughs> getting at here, uh, a good example I think would be Senator Paul Bailey's attitude towards one of Senator Janice Bolling's vaccine bills this year. Senator Bolling took a conservative stance and brought forward a bill to keep employers from requiring their employees be vaccinated. And Senator Bailey not only took issue with that, but voted against it, taking a Republican stance because he did not like how it would limit him and other private business owners. And it's like, okay, I see both sides of the coin, but one is certainly a more conservative stance, right? Having made this distinction though, I didn't call myself conservative until right around when I turned 18. I ran into politics, or I was into politics as a child, consumed a lot of right-leaning commentary, living in the South and having access to FM radio. <laughs> Point is, I really, I knew I didn't really care for the left. I knew I didn't care for some of the things that Obama did during his terms, but whenever anybody asked me if I was Democrat or Republican, uh, I would say that my parents usually voted Republican and that I usually agreed with them. I think the truth was that I didn't like the provocative side of politics. I didn't like the division. What I've come to realize though, is that you could almost say political division in the US kind of rests on one of those like X, Y axis thingies, you know? You know what I'm talking about. I don't do math, you know what I'm talking about. You almost have to choose which kind of division you prefer, okay? That's what I'm getting at. Because you either choose provocative politics and the divide is between left and right, or you choose diplomatic politics and the divide kind of falls between generations. Either the college Republicans over in Jefferson City host an affirmative action bake sale where the older right-leaning folks show up and they all bond over how funny it is and how it's a real stick it to the left type of moment, because it is. Um, or you have a situation where the college Republicans are pretty well liked by their Democrat colleagues, okay? They all get along, they all hang out, they all have friendly debates and they hardly ever like, you know, come at each other. In that case, you know, the younger right-leaning people and the older right-leaning people they aren't getting the opportunity to connect there. But, oh my gosh, guys, um, that might not even work because believe it or not, there's gonna be right-leaning people who are young and right-leaning people who are old who don't like provocative politics, who aren't gonna bond over provocative politics. So uh, there's gonna be people left out no matter what we do, it seems. But if we're focusing specifically on the divide between younger conservatives and older ones, I would say a few things, subjectively, of course, because uh, that's the word we're gonna be all about today. <laughs> Younger conservatives, in my opinion, uh, seem to be less likely to feel confident speaking their mind to their peers. I believe that this is primarily due to their educational environments and the internet culture and social media culture that we have today. Subsequently, I think younger conservatives are more likely to have a well-researched stance when they are vocal, when they do choose to speak, just because of how quickly they are typically shut down by their peers and by teachers, by authority figures in those educational environments and on social media and online. Um, I think a lot of young people are not just voting Republican because their parents voted Republican. 
I, I think they are making a conscious decision. I think it is very reactionary. It's emotional, it's personal, it's heated, okay, if you will. Um, something has impacted them, whether it was you know, their faith or their religion, or whether it was something that happened with COVID, or something that happened when you know, they got to university and they realized you know, just how crazy affirmative action is, or just how ridiculous all this like, diversity and inclusion speech is. Whatever it was, they have made the decision to say, I'm conservative, these are my values. It's not just this lackadaisical thing. They know what they're doing. And personally, I think the GOP is quite lucky, okay, that the left has gone full progressive. Uh, establishment Republicans are lucky to have virtually any young people on their side because really neither party as a whole fought for our freedom over the last few years. With the exception of some real conservatives on the right. Um, I mean, the reason that some members of the GOP still get votes at all is because they are the lesser of two evils. And, you know, that's kind of a running thing, but it is what it is, right? Um, left is not an option for those with conservative values. And if we're doing our civic duty in voting, we all go to the polls, there's only so many choices. The GOP is kind of the party that does nothing, like the pirates who don't do anything. Um, I realize the reference may be lost on some of y'all, but that's okay. <laughs> In the VeggieTales retelling of the Book of Jonah, which is like a hundred times longer than the actual Book of Jonah, we meet people in charge of the ship that Jonah gets on to go in the opposite direction of Nineveh. And these people are actually vegetables, but they're also pirates. And that's where we as the audience get an entire musical number about how they are the pirates who don't do anything. They just stay at home and lie around. They don't actually do any pirate things because they don't do anything. Sound familiar? Um, I asked around a bit outside of my usual circle, and this is what some young conservatives and also young Republicans had to say about the GOP. Um, and for the record, any of the quotes that I used today, these are from verified conservatives or Republicans. They're not, I didn't just put out a survey and let Democrats take it and whatever. So these are things that were said by people on your side of things. Um, one young conservative said of the GOP, we just need more conservatives in pol political offices, more passion, less baggage. Somebody else said, they are all moderate. They are allowing the left to infiltrate their voting. Another person said, they are being squishy, slash being pushovers. Another person said, in Tennessee, I think banning drag shows was publicly, a, or banning drag shows publicly was a mistake. I believe that if a person wanted to dress in drag, they should be allowed to in a truly free, Amer free America. Now, before you get a little too outraged, okay, I don't agree with that one. Um, <laughs> another person said, very judgmental of groups of people, race, sexuality, and political beliefs. That's what they think about the GOP. And then lastly, somebody said, I think a lot of Christian conservatives need to recognize that they need to have a political ideology that can apply to non-Christians as well. Christian conservatives can have whatever personal beliefs they want, but policy must be applicable to everyone. Now, obviously, these are all subjective opinions, but I think it's a pretty good display of the diversity of thought um, when it comes to the young people on the right. And would these young conservatives still vote for those squish GOP members if the only other option was progressive? Yeah. Probably. So there's something we would all seem to have in common, I assume. I also asked these young conservatives what they believed was the divide between younger and older conservatives. Just remember, these are subjective feelings, and if any of y'all start getting offended, we might think you're a leftist. <laughs> so somebody said, I think there is a lack of voice amongst young conservatives, but there is a genuine passion for our beliefs. Older conservatives had the voice, but not the passion like young people. This is probably because we believe what we believe for different reasons. A lot of us young people have been backed into a corner and are fighting back while the older conservatives have lived their lives and seem a little less passionate about fighting back. Another person said, I think their ideas stem from how they were raised and vice versa. The day and age is very different and things are changing at rapid rates. Another person said, in my experience, older conservatives are often more brash or harsh probably due to just not giving a crap with age. And I know the person who said this, and they mean that, oh, they mean that well. 
And uh, don't always present the best image of the entire political side, but most of the stereotypes do come from them, which makes it difficult to open up to others about your actual political beliefs instead of just nodding your head because you're afraid of being attacked for a negative stereotype. Another person said, I think younger conservatives have a better grasp on today's social climate, especially involving race and gender tension. That one is probably because we are in the education systems having it shoved down our throats almost every single day. Another person said, I think old conservatives are too judgmental and hateful with their opinions, and I think that they're, and think that they're right no matter what, while young conservatives actually think out their issues and try to work with liberals to talk things out logically. Just depends on who you are. I've seen young conservatives act the same way. Um, somebody else said, younger conservatives are more privy to the info being chucked in our faces. There you go. And another person said, younger conservatives are more familiar with the issues of our time. Example, LGBTQ issues. I also think that older conservatives bring Christianity into it much more. We also have pretty much lost hope at this point. I thought that one was kind of depressing, but you know, whatever. Um, and then the last one here says, I feel as though, yes, we do have a lot of the same ideals as older people, but we are also seeing more, such as climate change and how the earth is changing. While we are seeing this, most older conservatives are not. Again, these are all subjective, based off of each person's personal experiences. But now that we've touched a bit on where the divide might be between younger and older conservatives, there comes the question of why. Why even put the time and the money and the energy into engaging with this younger age group, young voters, young people who historically are not reliable conservative voters. Okay, why even attempt it when older voters consistently turn out of the polls and vote Republican at higher rates? Why bother when young conservatives seem to believe that there is such a gigantic difference between them and you guys? Well, I think the short answer is uh, death. Not enough if you laughed at that, which makes me nervous. <laughs> We're all going to die, right? Okay, and if a person believes in a movement, okay, a set of values, certain traits of a country, why wouldn't they want to pass that belief on so that it continues to survive after they are gone? There's your answer why. Okay, now before I tell you how to engage young conservatives, I'm gonna keep you all waiting, I'm gonna tell you how not to. You'll hear a lot of people suggest that the Republican Party and conservatives need to quit being so negative, and they need to develop a more optimistic approach in order to attract young people. This is just a personal preference. I think that's really stupid. Um, I don't like positivity that much. I think realism is the way to go, but that's just me. Um, you'll hear it that they need to be more active on social media, on TikTok, on Instagram, and all that fun stuff, right? And don't you guys want to do that? Doesn't that feel really in your comfort zone? Like, yeah. Alright, that's what I thought. Um, not necessary, okay. We're young, we don't need to be pandered to any more than like people of different races need to be pandered to, it's stupid. Um, we can look at policy and make decisions for ourselves, and if there's a young person who can't, maybe they need to just get to that point on their own. Um, you'll hear that maybe you need to leave Christianity out of it. You'll hear that you need to compromise on those conservative values that make you a conservative in the first place. But let me be very clear, there is a time and a place for compromise, and this is definitely not it. Which leads me to how you can actually grow and engage young conservatives and maybe bridge that generational gap. One, you can embrace your generational differences. Every generation has opinions about the ones that come before them and the ones that come after them. That's just life. Use the differences to your advantage. If there is a new issue that young conservatives want to focus on, whether you do or not, okay, try to find something in your life experience, something anecdotal, a success, a failure, whatever, okay, and see how it can apply to the issue of rising college tuition rates, for example. I don't really care to delve too much into that, it's not really my passion, but there's a lot of young conservatives who are like, hey, can we pay attention to this? Can we pay attention to what we see as the housing crisis? Um, and if you don't think that those are conservative viewpoints, try to find a way to make a conservative viewpoint on that issue so that young people have something to grasp onto when those issues are brought up. My point is, don't let generational differences kill the conversation. Work together. You both bring completely different things to the table. 
The second thing here is show respect. And I don't mean to come in here and tell all of you what to do. You know, I, I was raised to respect my elders, right? But um, with this one, I'll make this comparison simply because I know I'm in a room full of right-leaning folks. There is a big uh, idea, I guess you could call it, in uh, what people call purity culture. And it pretty much boils down to the idea that <laughs> women want to be loved and men want to be respected. And you know, that doesn't mean they don't want the other, okay? It doesn't mean women don't want to be respected and men don't want to be loved, okay? It's just which one takes priority, right? And in today's political scene, young progressives, young people on the left, are the ones who want to be loved. And young conservatives are the ones asking for respect. That is what each group seems to be asking for from their elders and on their side of things. Respect their life experiences just like you would expect them to respect yours. For example, both of you experienced COVID and the way that people handled COVID and the way that the government handled COVID. You all did. I did. Everybody did. <clears throat> but I can guarantee you that older conservatives and younger conservatives had entirely different experiences. Both are important and both are probably useful. The third thing here is to lead by example. Please don't be a headline reader. Please don't be a headline reader. I think there's a lack of bias-free understanding. And what I mean by that is, and I saw this with a lot of younger people because that's who I was around at the time. So uh, I don't know about all y'all, but when Roe versus Wade was being overturned, nobody I talked to could explain what Roe versus Wade being overturned actually did. It was just a lot of people saying, yes, Roe versus Wade has been overturned. And then there was a lot of people going, no, this is the worst thing that's ever happened in the world. And um, nobody could explain what exactly happened when it was overturned. And I was like, did anybody pay attention to what was in the rest of the articles or did they just read the headline? Just the headlines. Just the headlines. Mm -hmm. And you know, paywalls don't help with that, but that's just, that's just life. Okay, sometimes you gotta pay for information. But, but you don't have to pay for that specific information. You can figure it out without paying for, you know, a subscription. At least that's what I thought. Um, <laughs> let's see. Another aspect to leading by example would be to do research and back up your own stances. Even if you did research to back up your stance two years ago, five years ago, ten years ago, do it again. Because when young people are talking to other young people, they're expected to have sources, okay? Like there's if I, very much a double standard for like where you got your information, okay? And how backed up your sources are. I'm like, are you sure about that? Um, so I think a good way to encourage young conservatives while they're dealing with that is to also back up your own stances with research and be like, okay, well, this is how I did it, you know? Or this is what I think on this issue and this is the source that I used to back up my stance on this same issue. A few more quotes from some of those young conservatives I talked to. Okay, somebody said, um, I think older conservatives operate under the principle of this is how things have always been, which is fine. However, the reality is that it's not a good defense against ideologies. Things are currently changing and it's always been this way. It's not a convincing argument. And I would say it's not a convincing argument anymore. I think explaining why we believe what we believe and not just shoving propaganda in people's faces, showing love to everyone, even if you don't quite agree with what they believe is a good idea. That's what somebody else said. Um, and then the last one here is leading by example in their tact when it comes to talking about and engaging with the other side of the aisle, teaching young conservatives to be firm in their beliefs and how to handle confrontation from the left in a calm, civil, non-hurtful, logical, and educated way would also be immensely helpful. Same way that you teach your kids, you know. Don't, you know, pull each other's hair and like scratch each other in public. Like, don't do that. Like, do it at home. Like, you know? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> teach young conservatives how to handle themselves appropriately in heated political discussion with the opposing side. Fourth, stand up for young conservatives and back them up. Don't look down on the young conservatives who stand up just because they're standing up on an issue that you don't personally think is a big deal or an issue that you're not passionate about. As long as their stance is conservative, support them. If you don't understand how their stance is conservative, ask them. Maybe it's not conservative. Maybe they need to think through it some more. But don't leave your young to get attacked by the leftist T-Rexes, okay? Mm -hmm. It's hard to fight a culture war when you don't even have support from the people who are supposed to be on your side, 
and it can be extremely discouraging. Fifth, you got to let your con young conservatives carry the torch, guys. We need to be teaching young people the importance of gun rights and how to properly use a gun before we expect them to stand up for gun rights. We need to teach them how to be a political candidate, even if it is just for a local office. We need to show them how to win elections and keep winning them as time goes on. We need to show them the importance of voting, all of those things. Young conservatives can't carry a torch that they haven't been taught how to carry, and they certainly can't carry one that they haven't been given. And my last one for y'all here, okay? Do not compromise. I know I kind of said it earlier, but when I couldn't go back to school because I wasn't gonna wear a mask and I wasn't gonna get the COVID vaccine, um, I made the decision to wait and then eventually withdraw. During that time, I was consistently having conversations with adults who were older than me. Friends, people at church, people at my internships, Christians, Republicans, conservatives, whoever, right? And the one phrase that I heard over and over and over and over again was, but it's your education. But it's your education. But it's your education. And you know what? I wasn't willing to sacrifice my morals and values and honestly my freedom and religious conviction for a college education. And it was extremely isolating to be told by people that were supposed to be on my side that, you know, maybe I was just taking it a little bit too seriously. Maybe it wasn't that big of a deal. And then another phrase that comes to mind from these conversations was, compromise isn't a dirty word. You know who that was said to me by? A Democrat. Um, <laughs> well, you know what? Sometimes compromise is a dirty word, okay? So please do not compromise. Don't do it, man. Okay, don't compromise on your conservative values and don't ask young conservatives to compromise on theirs. Whether that's in the name of diplomacy, career, education, doesn't matter. Don't do it and don't tell young people to. If we keep letting things happen without fighting back, things will keep going in this direction. Sometimes sacrifice is better than compromise. Compromise, in my opinion, is for personal relationships, not morals and values. About it. I know Rick said we need some time for questions, so if anybody has one of those. That's a lot of questions. So. Okay, questions. Thank you so much for being here today. You're, you, you were very well prepared, and I understood almost everything that you said. <laughs> I would like to know that uh, in your experience, do you think that children that have been raised up like recently with i would say within the last three or four years as they're growing into adolescence uh, they have been inundated with the uh, race thing with the sexual identity thing with you know all the things that are happening in the school system to negatively impact them are are they more likely to turn one way or another as they get into adulthood and into adolescence do they is it the typical rebellion of the 12 year old that's going to do exactly you know what they say not to do it's very confusing because you know you hear about 12 year olds that are going uh to the texas children's hospital and getting implants so that they uh don't go through puberty and I'm just wondering if, if, you know, kids in first, second, and third grade, they listen to their teachers. They love their teachers. And their teachers are telling them a lot of lies. And it's a shame. That's a good question. No, I think that the thing is, is that the teachers are not specifically telling these children, you need to change your pronouns. They're not specifically saying, hey, you need to be the opposite sex. They're not looking at a small, like, uh, a 10-year-old girl and going, you look like a boy to me, or you act like a boy to me, are you sure that you're not a boy? Like, they're not necessarily directly telling these kids what to do. So there, it's just kind of this subtle inculcation of ideology, right? Whereas, um, you know, it just depends on the parent's approach. Like, is the parent saying, 
like, you know, if their kid comes home from school um, and goes, mom, I think I'm like the opposite gender than I am. Okay, is the parent going just, no, you're not, and then moving on? Or, no, you're not, say that again, and you know, you're gonna be in trouble, or like, no, that's not what the Bible says, or are they actually explaining it? Are they actually, you know, talking about this every day in a subtle way? To where it's actually making an impression on the child versus just their parent telling them no you can't do that I think, the I think that's a great point are mostly absent especially in this area where you have both you know blue collar both parents working they don't have the time to sit down and talk to their children about <coughs> gender, especially when they die horribly well, I think I think I think that's a great point that it, it brings up. It's it's a lot of the parental sure. parental responsibility to educate the kids and overcome a lot of the things that are going on. And I think you're right. Parents are absent. They shirk their responsibility. Maybe grandparents need to jump in a little bit more. That'd be that'd be a nice thing. Right? So, if the parents will let them. Do you feel that the uh, textbooks are leaning towards some of this that's uh, addressing, you know, sexuality? And if, have you run into textbooks, or maybe you're a little too old to have run into some of the textbooks that are leaning that way to push kids to be something else or believe something else? I mean, personally, I was homeschooled growing up, right? So, I mean, I, I never, the only time I set foot in a public school was to take the SAT and the ACT. Um, <laughs> and I was perfectly okay with that. But as far as, like, curriculum and textbooks goes, I, I guarantee you it's in there in some way, shape, or form. I guarantee you it is. Because, I mean, otherwise, why are we having these fights over curriculum? Right. Like, I just wrote an article a couple weeks ago on a Mother's Day lesson that they tried to pull somewhere, and um, it was, like, literally had two books, okay? One was about this girl who has two dads, and how does she celebrate Mother's Day? Oh, well, we'll take both dads to the Mother's Day celebration, because that makes sense. And the other one was about a bear who's a guy who gets confused about his gender because some ducklings think he's their mother. Like, that was their idea of a Mother's Day lesson for non-traditional families. So, and that, and that was for kindergarten. That was for kindergarten through second grade. What so, about, what about the books that are telling first through third graders about sex and how to identify or not identify with male or female? Personally, I think that sex education is a parent's job, and if the parent doesn't do it, there should be like a, another adult, like in the church, that steps in. Something like that, okay? I think that somebody that you trust as a parent, you should be like, hey, do you mind? I'm not doing that with my kid. Do you mind? I think it's very much on the parents. It should not be on the schools because you can't, you know, not teach your kids things and then be like, oh, why did the school teach it that way? Or the textbook taught it that way. Or the textbook taught it that way. But, yeah. Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Okay. So th this is one of my this is one of my favorite stories to tell. She was telling me to elaborate on my higher education experience with the curriculum. Um, one of my favorite stories to tell, I call it the they them senior story. So um, pretty much, I started going to university and I had this freshman studies course, okay, because I was required to take it even though I'd already finished freshman year, whatever. Um, and there are all these books and there's all this discussion on um, gender and all these sorts of things. And then I took a, um, I believe it was Introduction to American Literature course or something along those lines. And my professor was constantly trying to get us to see the gay subtext in all of the things we were reading. And I was like, okay, well, where's the gay subtext in this openly Catholic author from the 19th century? Like, where? I'm not seeing it. And he would point out what he thought was the gay subtext. And I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. That woman who wrote this piece of work has got to be rolling in her grave over you suggesting that one of her characters is even remotely like that. And then I took a course, it was a creative writing course, and this is where I met the Davim Senior. You know, he was quite obviously a male, didn't know what he was though, uh, liked to wear nice little pretty makeup, he was probably better than mine, but you know, sure. <laughs> um, and I wrote a one-act play for this creative writing class 
My professor liked it. He asked me to read it in front of class. I did so. And the first thing that happened after I finished reading this play is this they them senior raised his hand and I go, yeah, thinking he's just gonna say, oh, I liked it or I didn't like this or whatever critique. And he goes, that was amazing. I just felt so like in included and like, you know, I just, I, I you know, the, the case subtext was amazing. <laughs> And I was like, thank you. <laughs> there was no gay subtext. But you can see how it goes from the freshman and the sophomore classes to then you end up at the, this fifth year senior seeing the gay subtext in a one act play that a Christian conservative wrote with no gay subtext. <laughs> we have a bunch of other questions back here, but Bill, you're okay. Uh, David? Yes, hi, we're talking about one subject matter being taught here. How about the one where you're not supposed to like white people? Oh, sorry, Siri. I thought you said you're not supposed to like way people. And I'm white, people. Yeah. white people. <laughs> Figured that out. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, and I can't speak for K-12 schools again because, you know, I haven't been in those, I don't have kids in those, I probably will never have kids in those, but as far as my university experience goes, it is everywhere. Critical race theory is everywhere. It's in, like, literally every single class. It's insane. Wow. It, like, they find a way to put it in everything. And... You know, they'll tell you when you go study somebody like Ibram X. Kendi, who's, you know, written a lot of those types of books, right? They'll tell you in the courses where you're supposed to be studying his work or somebody else's work, they'll be like, well, we just need to study the people who, you know, came up with these ideas. We're not necessarily endorsing the ideas. And I'm like, well, you are if their ideas are part of every other course you teach. Mm-hmm. But yeah, no, it, it's it's everywhere. And they definitely, they maybe take a check my privilege test in a uh, diversity and inclusion course I had to take before I started university. It was a prerequisite to my courses. All right. Yeah, David. Not a question, but a reaction and a request and a suggestion. The reaction is the most important one. We have great speakers come to this all the time. And I usually walk out of here, you know, they, they believe in, you know, your idea of, of actually looking at reality, not just being positive all the time. It's easy to walk out from meetings like this discouraged. I'm going to walk out here today with a lot more hope than I had when I walked in the room. The, the, the request is, when the time is right, Please run for office. (laughs) My parents keep telling me to. (laughs) And the suggestion is, I don't personally think it's all that essential that you finish higher education anymore. Somebody look at you and say, well, I have a degree, or six, or whatever, and you don't. Mm -hmm. doesn't mean anything anymore. But if you're going to do it, go to Hillsdale. And if you want to stay closer to home, I'm going to put in a plug for Lee University. That's where my son goes. Oh boy! And uh, oh, you ought to meet this. Yeah, he needs a girlfriend too. That's true. And he'll be 21 in October. A younger man. Yeah. <laughs> Don't bank on that. His parents are doing a good job of spending his inheritance, believe me. Um, I, I think a lot of conservatives think that the, the way that we really messed up was by turning education over to the government. Uh, and I think by the time we realize that a lot of the young people are kind of way far gone, how do we reach young people before it's too late? How do we, uh, you know, before they get <clears throat> mowed over by all the uh, gender ideology and the critical race theory, how do we reach them and, and explain to them the Constitution and show them a, a, a repeatable history of government creating problems and then convincing people they can solve them? 
uh, you know, how do we how do we reach young people? I guess is the question. Get them when they're a toddler. <laughs> She's saying get them when they're a toddler. Well, yeah. No, the the easiest thing like to you know implement is just to be involved in the lives of the children that you know and the lives of your grandchildren and great grandchildren and so on and so forth, right? But my honest opinion, homeschool. <laughs> okay, people should be homeschooling their kids, and I know that that's not necessarily realistic, and there's a million reasons why you can't, and a million reasons why you won't, and I get it, there's some people who aren't cut out for it, but it, if your goal is to protect your children, homeschooling is the best option. That is the way to do it. Government schools were a screw up. Everybody who thinks that is correct, and you know, if you don't personally have kids to homeschool anymore, I think that the best thing that you can do is figure out where your local homeschool community is and figure out what resources they need. Because I'll, I'll tell you this right now, um, things have changed a lot in the homeschooling community since COVID because a lot of public schoolers started homeschooling. So it's drastically more secular. Okay. So I, I think that finding people you know who homeschool people who have been homeschooling for decades, okay, and see what they think should be done for children's education. Yes. I hear that students are leaving the public schools yep. in droves, yep. and they're going to Christian schools, they're going to private schools, and they're homeschooling. I think homeschooling is on the upswing a lot, right? There's a big expansion yep. of that. As there yeah. should be. As there should be, that's right. Well, thank you so much for being with us again. Thank you. Um, uh, if you decide to continue your education, if you don't, uh, God bless you. We want you to run. So come back and we'll help you raise money when you decide to run and whatever you're going to run for. Thank you again for being here. Thank you guys so much. Keep up the good work. All right. Yeah, there you go. School board. Uh, that would be good, too. So. Yeah, we really need to take back our school board. Okay, everybody, thanks so much for being here. Uh, we'll see you all next week with uh, Representative Lowell Russell answering your questions. Have a great day. And as Romans 8, 31 said, if God is for us, who can be against us?